Oh. Um, so, okay. So, uh, thank you so much uh, for, for coming. This is, this is really exciting. Uh, I, I can't believe that there are all these people still who are interested in Rust. Uh, so, I wanted to, to start off our, our day uh, talking about our language, uh, giving you some foundation for uh, the rest of uh, the sessions today. So, and also just to, you know, this is our unofficial mascot, Ferris. Uh, you know, we, we love them. There is someone who has a t-shirt with Ferris on it. It's, ah, yes, you're a great person. Uh, I need to get one of those shirts. They were sold out when I tried to get them. Um, so anyway, uh, to begin. So um, this also, you know, I, I want to say that, like, you know, this is our third event of this style in the world. We're, we're calling these uh, Rust Bridge events. We've had one in, in, the, uh, in Berlin, one in uh, Pittsburgh, and now Mexico. This, so this is all, this is very exciting. But uh, to keep this in mind, this is also a bit experimental. So you know, there are uh, the curriculum that we've built uh, today that it, it might be a little disorganized. You might run into problems. So please tell us if you run into problems so that we can fix this in the future. Also, there will be a survey at the end uh, to ask uh, uh, you all where, what we did well, what we did poorly, anything that we could do better the next time we, we host one of these events. Uh, we'll appreciate any, any input, good or bad. Uh, so as uh, I'm, I'm not sure uh, what Sebastian said. Oh, and also thank you so much, Sebastian, for inviting uh, me down here. This is, this is really fun. So uh, I'm uh, part of the, the Rust core team. Uh, you can see me down at the very bottom is my, my little uh, drain cover picture. Uh, I'm also joined by Brian Anderson from the core team, uh, who is over there with a wonderful beard. Uh, so we've been working on Rust for a number of years. Uh, we also are, are part of our core, uh, the community team that is also trying to help encourage events like this around the world run our survey, which you may or may not have seen, and do other things trying to like uh, get our community engaged and trying to build out things like this, try to do fun games, stuff like that. Um, we've also been around for a really long time. Uh, someone actually asked me how long I've been doing Rust. So this is my first commit that I've ever done to Rust, which is, uh, was on May 17, 2011 which I think is only about like you know, five or six months uh, after Rust was, was publicly announced. Uh, so I'm, I'm really old. <laughs> so, uh, and Brian actually I think was around even before that. But um, you know, it, was, it was nice back then. You could actually follow what was happening in the language. Um, and you know, the, the moment that I realized that Rust was actually going to be a real thing was when I couldn't keep up with what the community was doing anymore. It was a really nice experience when I couldn't read the commits. I couldn't actually see what was going on. Um, and, but like it's, it's people like all of you that have been, you know, kept me around. Like it's just been so exciting seeing all of the, the encouragement inside the, the environment. So anyway, to, to get into our uh, session today. So this is a bit of an overview. I'm going to talk about, um, you know, a high level of, of why Rust, why we, we built this. Uh, then go into more of the details about how to get Rust set up. Uh, if any of you do not have Rust, we'll, we'll start talking through the steps of getting installed. Uh, but we also have helpers here in order to, to help you uh, get ready. Um, so, so, okay. So to start out, like, why Rust happens. So Rust was developed, it came out of Mozilla Research, uh, where if I remember the numbers correctly, I think Firefox has 300 million users. Is that number correct? Let's say that number is correct. Uh, so there's lots of people using uh, Firefox in order to use the, the web. And it's, for the most part, almost 100% written in C++. And you know, after doing some analysis about like their, all of their security bugs uh, that Firefox and Mozilla 
uh, realized that that C++ was fundamentally unsafe. That you know, as as much as they tried to make C++ you know safe using all sorts of like analysis tools in order to improve how how the code was do working, sending up policies in order to do safe coding, it just you know it it turned out that it was just far too easy to make one mistake and compromise you know everyone's uh, security. So here's a very simple you know. A simple example of like one of the common problems if you've if you've uh, ever done uh, C or C++ programming that you know this is called uh, use after free. So here we we you know and this is like an example of like you know one of the the bugs that the Mozilla was running that as they were doing web audio that they would download some sound file from the internet and they would play it in the browser. All pretty simple. But you know they evaluated all the security bugs uh, that happened, and one of the the most popular security bug was things like this, where they would they would allocate some memory for the audio file, then you know some code path would you know clean up that file, but then someone else would try to use it, um, and then you know this itself could allow someone to take over someone's browser. And compromise their local machine, get into banks, do all sorts of horrible things, and this is just like a, you know, a trivial bug that you know someone doing code review might not necessarily see that something like this was would happen, and so you know there are languages like Java and and Ruby and Python that that use things like garbage collection to avoid this particular problem. Like so you, you can't have the use after free. But the problem that Mozilla was running into is that you know, if they switched Firefox over to one of these other safer languages, that there would be an unacceptable performance hit. That Java is, is really fast, like it's, it's a good strong language, but because it has a garbage collector, that it's still, you know, as an interactive user experience, that the the interface might pause, you know, every you know couple seconds for 50 or so milliseconds. So, not horrible, but it would be it wouldn't be a good user experience. And for the most, um, furthermore, it also, you know, wants to like if you've ever done any multi-threaded programming, that there's a lot of sharp edges to um, multi-threaded programming. Like there's, there's various ways that you can make simple mistakes and run into these non-deterministic programming languages. Or uh, sorry, non-deterministic bugs where things might work 98% of the time but fail you know, this 1% of the time and cause all sorts of problems. Um, which you know results in people not actually doing a lot of multi-threading coding because it's hard, and then we are now wasting resources on these uh, these uh, you know all of our laptops or phones uh, that could give a more pleasant experience. So, so Rust is you know what is called a systems programming language. So. Uh, does anyone here like you know have a good definition of what uh, systems programming is? Anyone? Okay. Okay. So, uh, so you know one of the common definitions of like systems programming is programming without a garbage collector. Like you know that's one of the the nice binary things that define you know a systems language versus a non-systems language. So you typically, you know, if you're writing an operating system or kernel or even like a lot of like the, you know, the high performance video games, that you need to be like as close to the metal as possible. Like you want it to, you want, you don't want to leave any performance on the table. You need it to be as fast as possible in order to you know, have your game be interactive and, and play on things. Um, so another aspect is that you know a lot of these systems languages either have a very small runtime um, or no runtime at all. Like so, if you're if you're programming an embedded device where you don't even have an operating system, that you need to you know systems languages support that. Whereas other you know non-systems languages like Swift or Go or Python, they have 
a, a lot of supporting infrastructure in order to, to support you know, how they are programming. So one of the things though about like systems programming is that there's I think some, some misconceptions uh, about you know, what it means to do systems programming. That it doesn't mean that like you have to be you know, an expert programmer. That you know, just because you want to write in a fast language doesn't mean that you have to be familiar with all these really archaic tools like make files and autoconf and you know, doing weird like flags on you know, GCC or Clang or all these other things or have to like really conform hard to the, the environment that you're running in. Uh, it also doesn't mean that you only have to be like writing you know, Windows applications or databases. There's, there's lots of ways that you can do systems programming, but you don't necessarily need to you know, have a PhD in, in databases. Uh, you also, in, in a lot of like these system languages, you typically have to care very deeply about memory. So you might have to deal with like pointers and malloking and freeing memory um, and you know, doing a lot of like manual management that you know, is not necessarily, you know, it's not building a website and just like being able to you know, make it easier for people to buy whatever stuff you're using. Like you know, there's, um, it, it doesn't have to be defined by that. And so that's, that's one of the things that Rust is, is working really hard on trying to make that uh, usable. And is, is everyone understanding me? Am I doing okay? Okay, good. Okay. Okay, so the, the Rust philosophy is that, you know, we, we want to, like, try to address all these things. And we want to try to, like, make it easier to do systems programming. Um, so we, you know, try to favor explicit programming versus like implicit, like we don't necessarily want to have as much magic happening under the covers. Um, but we also want to provide, like there is a lot of really nice abstractions that you get in languages like Python or Ruby where you have iterators and comprehensions and doing all sorts of these, you know, nice simple ways of walking through data structures. But we also don't like, if possible, we don't want you to have to pay for it. Like, we want it to compile down into essentially the same code that you would write uh, by hand. Uh, so we also want it to be memory safe so that you don't necessarily, like, so that all these bugs that, that Mozilla was running into, that it's just impossible for you to write it in, in Rust. Uh, that that will just fundamentally make everyone safer, but without... Uh, uh, without having to, uh, to you know, pay, you know, any real cost for it. We also want to have like really good error handling and really good, a really good user experience, like so that you don't have error messages that are just walls of text that you can occasionally get with C++. We want to, we want to make it approachable and and easy for people who are are you know ultimately even new to programming. Uh, easy to use Rust. So uh, now I'm going to start uh, walking through just getting Rust set up if uh, none of you have, or if, if any of you do not have Rust set up on your computer. So does everyone have Rust set up? Is there, is there anyone who doesn't that? Okay. So um, I'll, I'll try to uh, go through this relatively quick. So. There are a few tools that, that we have in order to make it a more pleasant experience. So RustUp is, is our official installer for our language. Like so, uh, Brian actually wrote this. Uh, so if, if you run into problems, you should, you should bug Brian. Uh, so we try to make it really simple to get Rust set up. So one of the, the things that we do in the language is that we actually release a new version of our compiler every six weeks. So uh, we do this because we want to try to uh, make sure that we, the language is not stagnating, that we, we aren't you know, forcing people to just stay on, like stay with bugs or you know, not take advantage of like new features that we develop that are stable. Um, 
So Rust, Rust up is the way that you know we can easily roll these things out to the community without uh, uh, without having to like jump through a lot of hoops. So it's it's pretty simple to install. So you can just you know you can just run this command in order to get it set up, um, and it will install Rust. So uh, so uh, does everyone? So everyone has uh, Rust installed. If not, you know we can help you out. Um, this is also like this is an interactive section. So if you want to run these commands and if you run into problems, just raise your hand and we'll we'll help you out. So okay. So we also have a number of other installers uh, that are you know set up for like if you're on Windows, it just has a standard Windows installer as well. Uh, likewise with uh, Macs and, and Linux, which you can see you know, on this URL at the bottom of the page. So. The next thing that we have is Cargo, which is our package manager. So for those of you that uh, come out of like the Python uh, ecosystem, so P Cargo is very similar to pip. Or if you're in Ruby, it's similar to Ruby gems. Or if you're in Java, that there's Maven and Ivy and all of that stuff. So this is our, our simple thing to do. It, it downloads dependencies, it can build your code, it can run tests, and it can even publish uh, to our central uh, 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 package management system called uh, crates.io. So it's, it's pretty simple to do. So if, if you have your computers open, you can actually run this if you haven't uh, actually uh, built a, a Rust project before, that you just uh, Cargo comes with a very simple command called cargo new that will create a little skeleton environment for you. Um, so, uh, for you know, for the purposes of this talk, that we're going to be you know stepping through a little bit of example that you can walk through. So here, I'll just uh, do cargo new dash dash bin, which will create a, a binary or executable that that you can run. And so if you you know, just do cargo new dash dash bin Rust bridge or whatever you want, and then cd into this directory. And if you are using uh, version control that we set up git by default, so you're welcome to you know do a commit now. Um, is anyone running into problems with this? Okay. All right. So the files that cargo new uh, will generate are just three files. So there's this cargo.toml file that describes the metadata about your packages, uh, about any dependencies that you might use. Um, we have a git ignore. We actually set up git inside this environment uh, for you just as a convenience. Um, and then finally, this uh, source slash main.rs, which is the actual Rust uh, file. So before we get to actually doing Rust, I'm going to step through the cargo file, which is very simple. So it just is the name, the version, and you know who is like setting up one of these projects. So Rust or Cargo will try to pull out this metadata from like if you have Git set up, that'll try to get the, your email address from there. Um, so you're welcome to change this to, to whatever you want. Uh, we don't have any dependencies right now, so this this will be blank. So the um, so now here is Rust. This is uh, Hello World that it should automatically generate for you. So uh, so if you haven't done any Rust whatsoever, so to walk through what the code is. So this is a function. So we uh, denote a function with fn, and then we have the function name main, and main is a special function. This is the, the entry point into the executable. So when you uh, execute the program, it will execute this. So here we're going to print out hello world. And uh, so print ln. This is actually called a macro. Um, but you don't have to actually really know the details about it. This is just how we, uh, the, the standard way for printing out to the standard out. So, uh, if you want to try running this, uh, you all you need to do is just run cargo run. So this should build the code for you, execute it, and it should print out hello world. Um, has a 
Is anyone running into problems with this? Okay. And if you want, um, okay, so the, the things that it'll generate is there's a directory called target, which is where all of the artifacts will be stored, and a cargo.lock file, which is, uh, it's a file that, that pins the dependencies so that if someone else tries to compile the code that it will use the same dependencies as whatever we set up. But we don't have any dependencies, so there shouldn't really be anything in that file. So you're now welcome if you want. You can start playing. You can like try printing something else out. You can try printing out two things. Um, you know, you can just start having fun with the language. So uh, the next thing uh, to talk about is that Rust does have extensive documentation. So there's, uh, you can go to our website, doc.rust-lang.org. Uh, or you can use the rust up command, uh, rust up doc, and it'll open up a local copy of the documentation. Uh, if you want to just jump directly to the standard library, you can just add a dash dash std. Okay, so now um, that I've gone through that, I'm going to start going into the uh, how Rust is like similar to other languages. Um, does anyone have any questions uh, right now? Okay. So first off, comments. So Rust is, it has, uh, you, you can do a slash slash, which is like you know, C style comments. Um, we also have the uh, block quotes. So um, you're, if you want, you can try commenting out things. Uh, slash slash will just comment out things on a single line, whereas block quotes will come in out like you know, multiple lines of, of, of code. So you're welcome to, to play around with this if you want. There's also a, a few other kinds of comments that are, you know, help drive the documentation, uh, but uh, we don't have to go into that now. Uh, next is variables. So variables are defined by, you know, using the, the keyword let that denotes a variable, then you have a variable name, an equal sign, and then you know, some value. So here we have you know, a variable name Eric, a, a variable age, and I'm getting old. Um, and then here we are just going to print out the, the, uh, the, these variables. So here, just to step through the string, this is actually kind of a, a little bit of a, a magic string. So you know, we have these curly braces that denote where the first argument is going to be put, and then the second curly brace is where the second thing is. So you should be able to you run this now, and hopefully it will print out uh, these things. Um, please let me know if anyone has any problems. Um, okay, so, so now an experiment. So we have a variable. Um, so we, we have, uh, this is, the separator is a little bit off, but like we're, we're creating a number of apples. So we, we say that we have 100 apples and then we want to add 50 apples to it. Uh, and then we try to print it out. So uh, can someone try running this? Uh, yes. Yes. So you should probably get an error message like this. Um, so this is, so Rust draws a lot of inspiration from functional languages, if you've heard of them, that by default, all of the Rust variables are immutable, which means that, you know, it's going to be a compile time error if you try to change them. The reason why we do this is that, you know, a lot of programming bugs actually come when people change variables out from under you and you aren't expecting it. Uh, so in order to get this to work, you actually need to explicitly say a variable is that you can change it by doing uh, let mut then do the apples. So if you do this, the language should, or the, um, you should now compile fine and it should print that you have 150 apples. So next up is, is types. So, um, have, um, so Rust is strongly typed, and it's strongly and statically typed. So this means that like, you know, so that 
when you assign a type to a particular value that it is, it is always going to be that type. So it's not like if you're familiar with Python that you could, you could have a variable that is a string at one moment and then you can reassign it to an integer. Uh, you can't do that in Rust. So we have you know, a number of different types. Like we have a lot of integer types. For example, we have uh, unsigned 32-bit integers, or assigned 32-bit integers, floating point numbers. Um, we also have like U8 in order to define a, an 8-bit integer. So we also have strings. So strings, unfortunately, are a little bit complicated in Rust. So we have a, a string and this ampersand stir. The, we call ampersand stir a string slice. So I'm, I'm going to get into this later because it's, it's always like a point of confusion in the language. Uh, we also have uh, booleans. So one of the things that you, you might have noticed is that when we were playing with variables that we actually didn't specify the type. So this is because Rust has type inference. So this means that the, if the compiler can automatically figure out the type of a variable that you don't have to do the work. So as opposed to Java and C where you have to explicitly say that you know, I want to do int foo equals five, that Rust will save that work for you. Um, sometimes though Rust is not able to figure out uh, the type so then you have to explicitly specify the type. Um, so, and you express uh, a type, like so here we have a, a variable age and then you do, sem uh, you do colon then the type name equals 30. Th um, and then uh, one thing though with Rust is that uh, the place where you always, you always have to specify types on functions. Uh, so you also, so it's, this will be easy if you're reading through code to see what is the expected input and what you're supposed to be producing. So really help out with that. Does, does that make sense? Any, any questions? Okay. So functions. So I mentioned, you know, the main function before, but like we also have other functions that you can define. It's defined the same way, that you have fn, and then the function name, and then an argument. So here we have, you have parentheses, then the argument name, colon, the argument type. And then you can have like multiple argument types that are comma separated. The output type is, you know, after this arrow and uh, the uh, i32. So then, like here, if uh, any of you have used uh, Ruby, that uh, Rust follows the same thing that like it will, you know, the, the last expression inside a function will be automatically returned. Uh, you could also explicitly say return n plus 50 semicolon and it would also return that value. Uh, and then here we just are adding 50 to 100. So uh, any questions? Okay, moving on. So, okay, so now we're starting to get into a uh, more interesting control flow. So here we want to do, you know, this is a, a movie rating. I'm, I'm not sure how they do uh, movie ratings in, in Mexico, but in the United States we have um, a few different ratings of like G and PG for kids. But then, you know, we have an R rating for, you know, if you're older than, you know, 17. Uh, for, you know, other, you know, more older movies. So, um, so here we define our variable and then you just do if, you know, n you know, is less than 13. Um, so this is very similar to other languages. One of the nice things is that you don't actually have to specify the parentheses around the, the conditionals uh, like you do in other languages. And then, you know, we have if, else if, and then else. So this should be, if you're familiar with programming, this should be uh, pretty uh, common. We also have uh, match statements, which um, if you are familiar with switch statements or um, case statements in other languages, this is pretty similar to that. 
Um, but ours are actually like a lot better than a lot of other languages. So here, you know, we could have written the other example um, on like you know what what kind of uh, what rating a movie someone could see by doing match then the variable name and then here we have a few different uh, options. So here we say like between zero and twelve, uh, you can you may see G or PG movies. So the way that this is written is like here we have this range e expression. So we're saying like zero dot dot uh, dot twelve. That that is just saying that like you know in between these two integer values, uh, that you know it will match this argument. And then we have uh, what we in the community call the rocket or the equals arrow um, that has the expression that we're trying to run. And then it just needs to be comma separated for the next one. Uh, then down here is the like you know we have underscore which you know if you're doing a match statement this is this is going to match all of the values like so if, if it's outside of this range it's always going to come down here. If uh, you're familiar with uh, switch statements from C, this is analogous to the default. Um, the other thing it's kind of hard to see here is that there is a uh, curly brace. So, like you know, you have curly braces for defining functions. If you want to have a multi-line uh, uh, match statement, you you also have to put them in in curly braces. So next is arrays. So uh, arrays are similar to other languages, but like they're actually a, like a little bit more complicated in Rust that we will get into uh, a little bit later. So here, if you want, you can update the little example uh, to say, you know, here we're going to create an array of three three integers, and then we'll just modify one of them, and then print it out. So here you'll notice that we actually have a different uh, thing. Like we have curly brace, colon, question mark, and curly brace. That's you know a bit of, of line noise, but you know it's actually you know here it's it is like a way that we can do formatting for specific types. So uh, we have the curly brace, closed curly brace is what we call display. So this is for things that it actually makes sense that you know they they have a natural representation as a string. So like printing out an integer or printing out a string should always look like this. But uh, sometimes you have some complex type like a, an array where there isn't just like one way of printing it out. So we don't necessarily want to just have a canonical way of printing it. So we have this thing called debug. Which just helps. It's it's designed for the developer for helping them figure out you know what they're doing. Whereas display is really designed for the user, the end user, in order to like uh, for them to be uh, you know able to to see what you know is going on. So we we don't necessarily want to make assumptions about like how like what kind of functions you're uh, and how you want to use these things. Um, uh, we we just try to give people options in order to express like how uh, they do things. So the other thing is that like if you have uh, there's a, a mode called uh, pretty debug. So this is colon or it's curly brace colon hash question mark and curly brace. It's kind of horrible if you aren't used to it. But what this does is like you know if you're printing out an array. It'll actually print out each item on a separate line. So if you have you know a hundred items in your array, it's not just this one big mess of a, a line. Um, so does this all make sense? Does uh, anyone need me to rephrase things? Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, in the previous slide, the was uh, this slide? No. Oh. Uh, before. Another one. Uh, this one? No, no, no. Two oh. previous slides. This one? Yeah. The return value, that's suppose is not the main function, it's another function. The return value, uh, it's uh, whatever the age matched up. Uh, yes. So, so the, uh, in this case, like, 
Yeah, the, uh, the return value of this function actually, so, um, so the return value, like we didn't specify a type here. Uh -huh. So uh, that means that like we, like the, the main function doesn't like, you aren't supposed to return a value. So conveniently the, the print ln produces like this, this is the, the unit type is, is what we call it. So this is, you can write this as uh, open parentheses, close parentheses. It just means that, you know, there is no value. And so that's, that's implicitly like implied by not specifying this. Yeah, but what I mean is the match being the last expression of the function Specify yes. the match uh, structure uh, specifies the return value as it is the last expression of the function. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's so yeah. So like you could, if you wanted to, like you could do let foo equals whatever is the value out of this match, and so you could do more advanced things for like you know deciding to like you know you could be returning a value instead of like you know printing out something. Okay. Okay. So, uh, any other questions? Okay. So, the other thing that will be useful for you um, is a another macro that we have called panic. So, panic uh, will just abort your program. So, you're welcome to like right now modify your stuff and write panic, and it will just throw an exception. Uh, saying I, well, it here it'll just say ah. So um, we also have uh, panics uh, will be automatically thrown if you try to access a value outside of an array. So here we have an an array with three items, but if we try to access like the ninth item in the array, we are also going to throw an error. Now this is also like the source of like many bugs in, in C. Uh, so you know, we just automatically, you know, if you do something like this that we're just going to abort the program. There are ways of doing this so that it, it doesn't cause a problem. Uh, but this is just one of the ways that we try to make, make things a little bit safer for you. Okay, so moving on. So arrays are actually pretty limited in Rust that you know, you, while you can modify the individual values inside an array, that you can actually add new items to it. Like so, uh, if you want to actually mutate the length of an array, you actually need to use a vector rather than an array. So it is like we actually write this just the same way as we do arrays. We just use the macro vec bang uh, in order to declare it. So beyond that, it, it acts just like arrays. So you can, you can you know, assign values to it and you can also modify the, the length. You can add new values to it. So this is much, probably a lot more similar to, to arrays that you'll find in languages like, like Ruby or Python. Um, that, you know, so we just give uh, different options. Like, we, like as I mentioned before, that we want to make things explicit rather than implicit. That this is one of these cases that um, we want to make sure that you understand that there is a cost to doing these things. Like we, arrays are much cheaper than, than vectors, but you know, a lot of times you actually want to use a vector because you don't, you don't have a fixed length array that you're working with. It, it could change dynamically. So the next thing after we have arrays is that you might want to be able to step through all of the items in it. So, um, so here we have a few different ways of iterating. Uh, we call these uh, for loops. So, you know, we, I showed you uh, ranges before, so you can actually do a for i in, you know, 0 to 10. Um, it's, uh, and then it'll just print it out. Um, but you might also want to step through all of the items in a vector, which is the, uh, uh, you know, here we de define a vector and then we, we do for name in names.iter. So this iter is a, a method call. So this actually produces a, an iterator that I'll, I'll go into in a second. Um, 
but we also have like a few other ways of, of stepping through things. So we have loops, which are just infinite loops. So we have while loops, so if you want to have an exit because of some condition, uh, and break, which allows you to um, break out of, of loops at any point in time. There's also, I forgot to put on continue, which is just like you know, C continue, so if you just want to skip to the next uh, loop iteration. Um, did anyone have any problems with this? This doing good? Okay, feel free to, oh yes sir. Can you use the microphone? In one of the previous slides, uh, the syntax was different for the iterator range or whatever. The 0 0.10 .10 in the previous slide, slide was 0 .0 dot dot dot. Yes, okay. All right. And I, I just tried that here yes. and it says it's so, like experimental. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I uh, didn't realize that we were using two different things. So this is, um, so we have inclusive uh, ranges. So, you know, if you do 0 0.10, an inclusive range, I think this is how it is. So this will be, it will actually produce items uh, 0 through 9. If you do 0 dot 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 10, that that's, oh wait, sorry. That is 0 dot 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 10 will be 0 through 10. So it will produce 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So it's just whether or not you want the last item to be included in, in the, uh, the, the list or not. Okay, good catch. I should fix that because I don't know if I really need to go into that uh, right here. Any other questions? Okay. Okay, so iterators. So this is one of like the really super cool things about Rust that um, you know, is one of my favorite things. So, um, so iterators like are in other languages, but we, we actually have these really powerful ways of stepping through items. So, you know, before we had like zero through 10, but say we wanted to uh, look at just the even numbers. So you could write a, you know, for loop and then have a use if in order to like test to see if an item like if the modulo of like some item is two or is zero against two, which you know this is is going to do, so that would test tell you whether or not a, a an integer value is even or odd. But instead, we have these things called like um, iterator methods that allows you to write a very simple expression that is applied as you're stepping th through things. If uh, has anyone used uh, SQL? Um, SQL, SQL, uh, yeah, so this is, it's actually, it's very similar to writing like SQL expressions. So you can, you can, uh, like filter is, is like a select statement and you can, you can do joins with, you know, other operators. So here we are, you know, this first one is just going to like, for each item in this, uh, this range that we are just going to apply this this is called a closure. So this, this will be called on each item where the, you know, inside the, the vertical pipes is the, the name of the, the argument. And then here we just have a little test where it's, it's going to return a bool Boolean. If the Boolean's true, then it will keep it. And if it's false, then it'll, it'll filter out that, that item. We also have maps. Like mapping is just like for each item that we iterate or we are stepping over, uh, create a new value that is just like we're multiplying this. So you know here we will do like zero through ten, but this will produce uh, you know zero one four uh, uh, six oh no four nine uh, yeah yes okay. And then uh, the, the last thing that, like there's lots and lots of these methods, uh, which you can see in our documentation. But like another one from like functional programming is, is called fold, where you actually are, you know, for each item you want to like, in this case, we just want to add up all of the items inside this array. So 
know, we, we are initializing it with a, a default value. We are like, you know, stepping through a closure of two values and we're just like, we are adding the value and then the next cycle we're passing in the result of this to the next closure. Um, if you haven't done functional programming, this, you know, it took me a little bit in order to, before I really understood fold. So if you don't quite understand this, that's fine. I can try to walk you through it uh, later. Um, so, and then I spoke about uh, the closure. Has, is there any questions about this? Yes. Oh, uh, here, I use the uh, microphone so you're on the video stream. These constructions, are, are these macros or? These are not macros. These are, so a macro in Rust is written with, like you'll always see the exclamation mark okay. for a macro. So these are just normal methods uh, that you can define on, on, a, on a type. And the, um, how do you say, the, the range, are they vectors? Sorry? The, the representation of the, the ranges are vectors? I'm not. The I'm, zero dot dot ten. Oh, a oh, range. Is that yes. a, a, the range? Yes. Are, are they vectors? They are not macros. They're, no, they're not vectors. Vectors. They are not. They actually, so, um, so this is actually like zero dot dot is actually an iterator. Like, so it is an iterator that like as it is, so it's not computing like all of the items. It is just under the covers, it just has a counter, and each time you step through it, it's under the covers adding one to that value and returning it. Like, uh, I don't know, generators in Python? Yes, exactly. Yeah, so this is, this is just like a, a generator versus like iterators. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So one thing also I forgot to mention about like the coolest thing about iterators is that that these actually, like you have all of these little expressions, but it like compiles all the way down, like into like, you know, pretty much the fastest way that you could write these expressions by hand. Like all of the, like you could have a huge number of these like iterator methods being called. Like you could be mapping, filtering, then grouping, and then doing another mapping. You can actually do really horrible uh, things to these things. And it all just like compiles away into essentially as fast as like possible. So, you know, all of the cool things that you can do with like Python generator expressions that, you know, this is, you know, this allows you to do really complex things without them over. Yes. Uh, in this case of this iterator, um, where, where is the store this, this, this iterator? Is it in the stack? Is it in the heap? Where? This, this is, uh, so the, uh, this would all be on the stack, but inside the iterator, it's, it's opaque. Like it could be internally doing something on the heap. So it could like, like say you're, like if you want to iterate through a tree structure, that usually you have to have some kind of, you know, a, an internal stack in order to like keep track of where you are inside this whole thing. So you might have to like allocate some memory, but, uh, it, it's all like if you don't need to, then like it's all on the on the, on the stack. So it should be, you know, quite fast. Like, okay. So any other questions? Yes. Oh, uh, wait for the microphone. Is is there a way to make a shortcut instead of specifying that? The function that you pass to filter or map or fault, let's say, in, for instance, in fault, that you pass like this, the name of the method and takes that as yes. a entire yep. function. So you don't need to pass a closure. You could just give it a regular function. Like, um, yeah. is, is there a special syntax for that, or do you just specify the name of the just function? Just the name. Okay, mm -hmm. that's cool. Yeah, okay. there's. Okay. There is one place where you might need to do something slightly fancy, like if you have a, so I haven't talked about structures, but like you know, structures are like classes um, in, in other languages. So, you know, it's a, an object that has some kind of, it has fields and methods. And so if you have a field 
that is a function pointer. Like, so if someone has assigned, like, you know, one of the fields to a function pointer, then you occasionally need to put parentheses around that in order to help Rust understand if you're trying to, like, call it versus, like, pass it to something. It's complicated. Like, you probably won't see that now. And if you ever do run into that, that you always can ask us questions here or, like, on any of our, our uh, other resources, web pages and stuff. I was wondering in the previous slide, um, you used iter, and in the next you didn't use iter for for to the four. So I was wondering when when I need to 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 use iter and when not. Okay, so so okay, so there are uh, let's see. So the so in Rust, like there are. Like one of these other things of like trying to pay as you go, that there are like for a a vector, there is actually a few different kinds of iterators. So I haven't talked about this yet. There's there are things called uh, references. So let's say say each of these items, say they're like some really complicated, like expensive large structure. Like so not just like these strings, but like something that is using like you know, tens of, you know, bytes, and you don't necessarily want to copy them around. So iter is going to uh, create a reference to each of these items. And so that, all it's doing is under the covers, it's just passing around a pointer to each of those items. So it's, it's very cheap um, to pass it around. There's also um, a iter mut, like iter underscore mut. So this will create a iterator that returns mutable references. So if you want to mutate, like change the items that you're stepping through, that like you know it will it will allow you to do that. And then the last version of like a iterator is um, is uh, um, what do we call it, Brian? It's like into well, yeah, into iter. Okay, so what this does is that it will consume all of the items. Like, so say you want to like move your expensive structure out of like a vector and into a like a hash map. That you, you don't want to like you don't want to copy all of that because it might actually be really expensive to copy these things. Uh, so you could actually consume all of the items out of the vector and move them into this other data structure without doing like any copies. This would consume all of the, like it would ultimately destroy the vector because like there are no more items in it. So there's there's a lot here and you know we'll we'll I think we'll maybe talk about that later on today but like uh, happy to also talk uh, off the other uh, like during the breaks uh, through all these things. So um, any other questions? Oh, okay. So, um, okay. So iterators. So enums. So this is uh, one of the other like things that I really like about the language. If you've used C or Java, uh, C++, they have enums, which is like you want to have some value that only can represent like these three values. Like you know, if we have traffic lights, like uh, I'm not sure here but in the US like our traffic lights are uh, red yellow green and so we want to just make sure that you know we have some value that can only ever be these things and if you ever try to do something else it will be a compile time error and then you can use these with match statements so here we are just going to do something for each of you know if it's green we want to go if it's red we stop yellow we want to slow down uh, it's, it's pretty similar to what you get in, in other uh, languages. But in Rust, our enums are actually like so much more powerful than that because we can actually pass in values. So here, like say we were making a little video game and we wanted to like, you know, have, you know, either decide whether or not we're doing a single player game or a multiplayer game where we want to say that, you know, how many players are in this. So you can define it just like, you know, uh, you have, you know, the enum type uh, 
colon colon, then the, the enum variant that you want to use, and parentheses the values. And then you can use this with match statements in order to do something special based off of the particular values. So you can do uh, multiplayer with uh, parentheses uh, two. You call a thing about like recommending a game of checkers, a two-player game. If you have four people, you can recommend a game of bridge. Or if you want to do something for any number of players that you can, you can suggest like, you know, something like playing tag. Does this make sense? Yes. So this enum is some sort of uh, abstract data type? Uh, it is a type. It's, it's, uh, yeah, can you do fancy, fancy stuff like defining a recursive type? Yes. Like yep. a tree or something? Yes. Yeah, so you can, you could very easily write like a tree structure where it's like, you know, this could be, you know, the root node and then this is like a tree and then you just have it recurse upon itself. Okay. So it's, it's a very simple way of, of doing these kinds of complex structures. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. So now I'm going to start getting into things that are particular to Rust itself. Uh, so the, okay, so we saw enums before. Um, so one of, the, one of the other things that is special to Rust is that we do not have this null type that you might have seen in other languages, or nil. So uh, there's, like for all of our values, they, you can't just assign null to them. Um, this is because like there are just so many problems with like people dealing with like null pointer exceptions getting thrown or like you know if you're in C if you try to dereference a null pointer, who knows what could happen? You know someone could use that as an avenue for compromising your your system. So we we've defined in our standard library uh, what we call is the option type. So this is just a normal enum that you know either represents some value. Um, and this is a, a generic uh, type, so you know you have like this uh, less than symbol t greater than symbol. If you view c, it's just like generic types and and c. So this option can represent like you can use an option type in order to uh, represent any any value. Um, and then like you have to explicitly uh, do a match statement in order to unpack the the option type. So as an example, like here. Like, you know, a lot of our libraries are written such that, you know, it's going to use option types in order to make you, force you to handle the case that maybe there might not be a value. So here we have a vector, like, you know, the vector just has my name in it. And if we use the pop value, which just removes the last item in an array, and if you print it out, then you will, you should get a, it should say, you know, A is some Eric. But if we call this again, like at this point, the, the instru instructor's uh, list is empty, that pop will return none for you. So, you know, it will, uh, it forces you to like handle the case that like, you know, that you might not actually have a value. So, um, you could either uh, you can define a value by just doing sum Eric. Now, option is like really popular, so you don't need to explicitly say option colon colon sum. We, we've imported this into the, the namespace for all of you. So you could either use the uh, match statement in order to pull apart, like to handle the case that there is a value in the option type, or there's also a function that like if you know like you're doing just like some experimentation or you know that it's impossible that you know this value will always have something that you can use this uh, dot expect method and if it ever turns out that the uh, that this value actually is none then it's going to throw a panic and abort your program so this is nice for you know, simple testing, but generally speaking, like in, in real programs, you, you shouldn't be using expect, you should, you should explicitly handle the, uh, the use cases. Um, does this make sense? 
Any questions? Okay. So here's, I, this is just an example of using match in order to do something for a particular value. Like in this case, like we define a option type that you know, has no value, like we're using a none. And so when we match on this value, it's gonna print out you know, no name. Uh, but if you change this to sum, that you would, you would get a, a name printed out. So the next thing that you know, we have is what we call is a result type. So this also is just another enum. Uh, but this is generic on, on two different types. So you could either, like, if, so this is like, we don't have exceptions in our language. This is how we, we handle errors. So, um, so you, you either have the case that everything's fine and you get a okay value in your enum, or you get some error and, you know, the, uh, the system is, you know, you have to do something. Like, you don't necessarily want to abort the process like say you're trying to access a website and it turns out the website's down, but you don't want to kill your program. You want to like maybe retry in five minutes when the website's back up. So here's just like another example. Like in this case, like we're trying to parse a string into a number. So this is a, another method that we have, dot parse. So uh, in this case, like parse, like we can do parsing into a lot of like different types. So this is just one of the, the ways that uh, you explicitly say, I want to parse this value into an I32, uh, a signed 32-bit uh, integer. Uh, we, we call this little expression the colon colon angle bracket, close angle bracket, the uh, rocket fish, because it kind of looks like a, a fish that's moving really fast. Uh, so this will return a result type. It will be like num will either be okay because like in this case it's actually an integer or if we are passing it a string that's not an integer that it will be an error type. Uh, you're welcome to try to run this now or we can do this later. I think we're starting to run low on time. So uh, here's like result also has the dot expect which is just like what we had for options. So if you want, if you are like if you're confident that you're always going to like the thing is going to succeed then you can use expect and it will it will abort the program it will panic the program if if there is uh, if it turns out that your expectation was wrong any questions about uh, result or option okay oh and then here is just like the match expression I think someone earlier was talking about using match as like part of like an expression. So this is an example of this. So here we're parsing an integer and then, you know, if it turns out that it's an integer, then we're just going to add five to it. But otherwise, uh, in this case, we're going to, you know, we check to see it's an error and there's the underscore saying like, we don't care what the error message is um, and we're just going to return zero. So uh, one of the cool things, like as, as another digression uh, to this, is that if you actually leave out, like in a match statement, like say we, we remove the error statement, Rust will actually, um, will at a compile time error say like, hey, you haven't handled all of the cases. Uh, so this is like a, a way that like, you know, it will make sure that, that you are like if there's something that you, a condition that you weren't handling, like Rust will actually prod you into making sure that you're handling these conditions. Okay, so, the, oh yes. Yes. What does mean the double column after the bars? This? Yes. This is, um, so this is, this is the rocket fish. So this is saying that I'm parsing, like I want to parse this value and that I want, the re I want you to parse into this particular type. Like so this will say the return value is going to be an I32. Uh, this is using like some generic programming uh, that is like you could substitute this into like a I64 if you want a 64-bit type. Uh, but parse is generic, so you can actually use parse for 
like you can actually customize it. So if you have like your own type that you want to parse, like say you want to parse a string into some URL structure that you could you could implement this parse thing, and then you know it just you can use it uh, like that. That's getting you know a little bit more advanced. So I'm not sure if we'll end up talking about that, but I'm happy to talk offline. Any other questions? Yes. So in this case, the num variable is, is going to match the error case. Yes. It, what, what is going to be its value? Uh, the, what what would be the value for the error? Yeah. Like so, this is uh, this will be some error type. So you can actually like it depends on um, uh, like. This actually is like the error is coming from parse. So I think like parse could have its own error type saying like, hey, I tried to parse this thing, but the second character is a letter, not so, a number. So you, you have to explicitly uh, throw the exception to, to the standard output? Yes. Okay. Yeah, if you want. Like if you, are, if you are expecting a particular error type, like you could, like this could be something that you might want to manipulate. Handle. You okay. it might like it might say, "Hey, you should retry this in five seconds." Like okay. it's it's really it depends on on the the implementation. Okay, thank uh, you. But that's actually a good lead into uh, the next section. Um, that uh, so sometimes you actually don't want to care about like the error message, like you know. Like say you know you are expecting like you're implementing something to you know you want to parse some string and then you want to add some number like five to it, but you don't like if it turns out that you're passing in a uh, something that's that's not a, a string you just want to like throw that error up to the the person who's calling you and make them handle it. So we have a shortcut called like the question mark operator. So you can just add that at the end of something that's returning an option, and if it's if it's a error, that it will automatically return a result type or a result value up the uh, to the next level. But if it's if it if it's uh, if it's okay, it's going to automatically unpack the result type for you and return the value. So you know the result of this is going to be you know just another integer, and then you can add to it. Um, in order to do this, you have to be using a function that is returning a result type, though. So in this case, this is the, the error type that, that you're asking about before. Um, and then you have to, um, you have to make sure that like, you, know, you, you repack the result value in OK in order to like, make sure that it's, it's a result type. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. So it's, it's like if you always are running code inside a try block or something like that? Yeah. Yeah, it's like that. So it's, this is all, it's, this is what we call syntax sugar. So it's things that you could write explicitly by hand if you wanted to, but we, for common cases, we want to like make it, you know, a little bit simpler for you in, uh, in most cases. Okay. Thank you. Hi. So in this case, you declare result as a 32 integer and a parse int error. Yes. And you handle the OK answer, the OK result, just uh, returning the, the addition of the parsing result plus 5. Mm -hmm. So there is no error uh, value because you are throwing up the case of the parse int error. Uh, yes. So, so what? So when you use this question mark, so if say this we passed in a a non-integer string, that this just does a short circuit and it will just like return um, a it will just return the error like this error up to the chain, um, but then it also like you know will like if everything's okay that it will. Like this expression will evaluate into the parsed integer. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, and then we just have to rewrap it in in uh, 
uh, the result type in order to, to propagate it up. One of the other things that you can do, like in this circumstance, we're returning an I32, but you could also, like say we wanted to like reparse this into a string or like return some other value that we could, the okay type could be something else if we wanted it. Um, any other questions before moving on? Okay. Okay, so strings. So I mentioned that strings are really complicated in Rust um, and we're sorry about that. We, we are trying really hard to come up with simpler ways of dealing with strings. Um, the, uh, the reason why they're complicated is because this is also like uh, this whole explicit versus implicit. Like we're trying to make it so that like if you need to, you don't have to pay for something expensive. Um, so strings are allocated. They're just, they're really just like vectors. Like they, under the covers, are allocating a block of memory. You can, you can add characters to a string. You can, you can remove characters. It's, it's easy to manipulate. But you don't necessarily always want to be allocating, you know, strings. Like, you know, if you're in a, if you're implementing a operating system that you don't want to, like, do unnecessary work of like string manipulation if like you can just pass around static uh, string arrays. So we also have uh, this thing called like ampersand stir. So that's, that's what we call a string slice. So string slices are just a, they are a view into a string. So they, like under the covers, they are really just a pointer and a length. Um, they, uh, so they're very cheap to copy around. Um, so whereas like with strings, you, you, uh, you, like it's expensive to construct them, like with, with string slices, it's pretty cheap. So, you know, so one of the, um, one of the common problems that you will probably run into in Rust. Yes. Oh, oh, yes. Thanks. In the first example, something to a string, a number, a boolean, are objects or something? Yes. Yes? Um, well, so, sorry, say that again? A, a number, um, I, I32, boolean, are objects? We, we can use the method to a string? Yes. Yeah, so the, um, um, I'll, like, so you can actually, uh, like we've, like on all of the primitive types, I think we've, we've defined to string um, and that you can, you can manually add them to types that uh, you create yourself. So we, we try to add a lot of like helper methods that, that make things like this a little bit simpler. Okay. So um, they are like, it, we're, like they are objects in a sense um, that they are not necessarily, they are not like allocated, they're like real, you know, they just fit inside of a register inside of a CPU. But yeah, they are kind of like objects. That's, there's, yeah, they, it gets a little bit more advanced when we, we start going into that. Oh, okay. So, any other questions? Is, is this uh, one case of the zero cost abstraction? So in terms of performance, this, uh, you can consider this uh, built-in value, but you manipulate it as an as an object. Or? Well, so the like so, um, like so, if you call like you have an integer and you call dot two string on it, that that is going to it it has to allocate memory. It has to like parse the thing into some some string. Uh, so that is like there is some cost associated with it. But if you don't ever call to string on it, that you aren't going to be allocating memory. Okay. Makes um, sense. So it's, it, that is like, you know, part of our philosophy of like, we, as much as we can, we want it to be like opt-in that like, you can always do things that are more expensive, but like we try to make sure that you don't have to do the expensive thing. Uh, this is one of the, the ways that like Rust makes it like, you know, we try to make, you know, in most cases, everything like as fast as, as C. Any other questions? 
Just a quick question. Is there a, a preferred way of like to string or to specify it? Like, Not really. Like, like there's there's no like performance difference between calling to string or string from like it it like frankly it just depends on, you know, there's it's, you know, uh, there are so under the covers there are like you know we have these things called traits and like there are ways that you can generically program like you can make a function that says like I want to be able to take a generic type that has the ability to call to string on it um, but I don't really care about what the type is so like there are some things like you know when you're going down there that like you might want to use one function or the other but for the most part it doesn't really matter it's at this point, it's kind of like a style. Okay. Um, it it also is like somewhat of a implementation detail. Like as like some of these methods, um, like we we had to do some some changes inside the compiler in order to make them more efficient. So that there are some like there's also another method called to owned mm -hmm. that does the same thing. At one point in time, to owned was cheaper than to string, but it's not anymore. Oh, okay. So. It's uh, like we are, like we are ultimately trying to like you know all the changes in Rust like you know we are trying to evolve the the language over time in order to make it faster, but we also don't want to break people's code. So there's, you know, it's you know there there are a few things that are like you know are not necessarily the like the best way of doing things, but you know it's that's the life we have to live with like lots of people using our language. Okay, so the common problem that you all are going to run into is like, you know, there are some cases where like here we're passing in an integer and we want to see if it's divisible by three. And if so, we want to return fizz. Um, otherwise, we want to just return the number. Like, you know, it's just kind of a silly example. So um, if anyone is, is playing along, is... Uh, uh, if you get the error message, anyone? Okay, so if not, you'll actually get an error saying like, you know, fizz is a string slice, but you know, you're trying to return a string. So this is one of like the kind of the annoying parts of Rust that like we're trying to figure out if we can we can uh, do this a little bit better. But usually, you might just need to add like a dot to string on one of these, you know, the uh, the the strings because when you write like quote something end quote that's actually a string slice like it's it's uh, it's a compile time thing there's no reason to allocate memory for that because we can we can store it in the executable itself so you might just occasionally need to do these add the two string um, any questions oh yes. So, so is uh, the string slice in the in the string is can you see them some like in JavaScript the box values of the built-in because in in JavaScript you can say new string and say put a value so it's something like that you get like m more functionality out of a, a box a string that uh, row a string. Not well. So you do get more functionality with with strings rather than string slices. Like strings, you can you can mutate. Like you can add, you can append on extra like characters or even like other strings. Um, but you can't do that to string slices because they they are just pointing to some memory. It's possible they're you're actually looking inside of some other string, so you can actually append uh, values to it. So when when you when you define a variable with the mod uh, keyword, uh, a string in this case, are you uh, so you don't have to say any more to to a string? It's already a string. But if you don't use the mod, it's going to be a string slice. The uh, no. So the um, so the okay. So the uh, let's see how to answer this. Um, so, the 
so if we, so okay, so say we didn't have, like, so we're, say we're here. So you're, you're asking what happens if we didn't have the else expression? Uh, I mean, well, at the time that you uh, initialize a, a string variable, is going to be a string slice or is it going to be a string? It's, so this, this will always be a string slice, like, you know, having, like, it doesn't automatically convert itself okay. into a string. Um, you have to explicitly, you know, call, like, to string on the, you know, this thing in order to make it into, like, a, you know, a string with a capital S. Okay. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Okay, any other questions? Oh, over here. <clears throat> Are the strings with capital uh, pooled, like in Java, that you have a string pool and you can optimize the reference to strings? So uh, we don't have a, uh, a string pool. Like, under the covers, this, uh, uh, like, we are, this is just like pointing out a block of memory that it's, it's allocating. It is possible to write things that are trying to, to, uh, to implement like st pool strings if you want. Uh, it's just not in the standard library. Uh, I know that the Rust compiler has, has one of these things in order to try to, to save uh, on copying strings. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty common pattern uh, if you need it. Okay, and the strings pools are uh, in the um, text segment. Sorry, Do, does the strings slices are uh, in the text segment? Yes, uh, maybe. So this you're talking about inside the the executable, yes. like the static section. So mm -hmm. this so this string actually would be in the static section. But it's also possible to create a string slice of like pointing inside of another string. So I actually, I think I talk about that. Uh, oh yeah, under the, the slices. Um, were there any other questions before I get to uh, slices? Okay. So as I was saying, like string slices are views into some memory. So this is just a pointer at something. So it could be a pointer into the static part of the binary. So this is like, you know, it's completely free. Like, you know, there's, there's no, it's not on the stack. It's, it's just like, you know, one of these things. But it can also be pointing inside of like some allocated string. Um, the other, so the other thing about slices is that it also understands how long of a slice it is. So if you are looking at some allocated string, that you might only be looking at a subsection of, of this string. So um, slices, like we also have like array slices as well, which are the same as string slices. So you know here, uh, so we have a vector type which you know, uh, I don't think I actually explicitly said is vec of like, you know, a vec of i32s, that a array slice into that vec is just written as like ampersand bracket then the type. And so in this circumstance, like we have a vector of, of five items. Say we only want to look at the last two items in uh, the, the vector, that you can use the, you know, the so it's kind of hard to see. This is like ampersand v, or the v is the, the value that we defined before. That we then use the range expression in order to say we want to look at like from the third item all the way to the end. So this should, if you um, are writing this in, in code, will print only, like when you print this, it will just print out four and five. Um, uh, so just like, oh yes, uh, is there the microphone? Hi. 
So I'm I'm kind of out of the loop with Rust. This is actually the first time I'm seeing this Rust syntax. syntax. And oh, sure. I'm coming from Go, mm -hmm. and I see that this is uh, quite uh, like like in, in Go, where you have a, a static uh, array, a, stat a static uh, sized array, and you can make it dynamic, uh, make a dynamic array using the slice. Is this correct? Is this like in, uh, implementing in Go? It's, it's not quite like I think in, uh, so I, I'm, I haven't done much Go, but I think in Go slices you can, you can append items to a slice. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think uh, yeah. They, they 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 create an array if you, if they okay. run out of. Yeah, space. You, you can't do that. Like so, uh, there are a lot of like methods that you can do to uh, to slices, uh, but you cannot actually you can't change the length of a slice. Um, however, it actually is possible. Like you you can take a sub slice of a slice. So. Yeah, after we've like created this slice, you could be like, I want to look at the first two items in this slice. Um, so all that is is possible to do, but you can't actually manipulate the the underlying data structure and grow it to be like bigger or larger or smaller. All right, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Uh, does the I don't know the the vectors or the slices uh, does the, those have a header for the lengths or uh, some property of the memory that they are pointing to? So the uh, the vector does. So the vector has under the covers it has like a block of memory and it knows how much memory has been allocated for it. The slices all all the slices is a pointer to like some you know some place in memory. And then the amount of items in that slice. So all it is is just a pointer and a length. Okay. Thank you. Um, is um, is it safe to assume that any method that I have on on vectors like filter or whatever are going to be available on arrays as well? Yep. Is is part of the philosophy of the standard library the language? Yep. Okay. That's nice. Oh, sorry. What was that? We need to finish this. Oh, um, I think we're we only have one other thing to to cover. Uh, so, well, okay. Actually, we have two other things. So, as I mentioned, that they're string slices. They're just like vector slices. So here, we can you know we create some some string and then we can do a slice inside of that in order to only look at the first. Uh, for for characters. So one thing with strings, if you ever do this, that we're actually looking at the number of bytes, not the number of characters. Um, so if you ever need to look at just the first number of characters, like um, there are other methods for that. It turns out that like strings and encoding and UTF-8 and like what exactly is a character versus a glyph versus like all sorts of other things. It's really complicated. Uh, so. If you ever need anything like that, you can ask for help, and I can point you at documentation. Okay. Um, so the last thing, and this is actually one of the most important concepts in Rust, is ownership. So I think we're going to be talking about this a lot more later on today. Uh, but uh, ownership is all about like how Rust is able to work without needing garbage collection. Like at at a really high level, it's actually it's a relatively simple thing. Like it's like, you know, it is just the compiler tracks who owns uh, what. So in this circumstance, like you know, I have this water bottle. Like if I give this to someone else, then you know it's their responsibility. They can do whatever they want with the water bottle. They could throw it away, uh, uh, or they could give it back to me. So this is this is basically you know. Like by tracking this in the compiler, then the compiler knows when to deallocate things. So, uh, so under the covers, we're implementing this with like free and malloc. So we're doing all that memory management for you. So the um, you know as I mentioned that there's this whole transferring ownership. So like you know if you want to uh, like here we've allocated some block of memory and then we call this function print vec. So this actually is going to 
produce an error um, because we're actually, like in this first line, we're transferring ownership of this vector to the function. And then at the end of the function, it actually is going to uh, delete all the memory associated with the vector. So when we call print vec again, we actually, this is going to result in a compile time error saying that, you know, the, the vector was moved into this other function. Does that make sense? Okay. So you don't always want to be moving these things around because that's actually inconvenient. Like, you know, in this case, like we're, we just want to print out a vector. And so we don't actually need to take ownership over that. So this is where references come in. So references is uh, help us implement borrowing. So this is saying like, you know, I want to retain ownership over a piece of thing, like, you know, my water bottle. I'm going to loan it to you for you to like, you know, I could either, you know, in this case, I could just, you know, I want you to give it back to me when you're done with it. So the way that we represent like, you know, giving someone else a reference to something is by using this ampersand symbol. So this is just saying like, I want to like, you know, give someone uh, a, a temporary loan, but I want to own it so that I can delete it when you're done with it. So here, this should work fine. Uh, where we are just doing an ampersand. So one special thing about this syntax is like we are doing, like we actually, like the way that you create a slice from a vector is that you do this ampersand, you know, the value, then we do dot dot saying like we want to grab a slice of the entire thing. And then down here we just have a slice that you can print out. So the nice thing here is that you could actually use this, this method print vec with uh, you know, if you have one of these, like an array that's stored, like a static array that's stored inside like the executable that you can't modify, that you can use this function on it as well as using it with like vectors that are dynamic. This is also really useful for strings, like if you want to be able to use one of these methods to print out strings. Um, so the other thing that I kind of touched upon with iterators is that you can have mutable references as well. So say, you want to pass, like I have a vector, I want to allow someone to modify one of the values inside of my, my array slice that you can use just ampersand mut and pass it, you know, this slice. And then it's okay for it to change it. And then you can do this a few times and then print it out. And that this shouldn't be a problem. Are there, oh, are there any other questions about this? Like, this is, this does get complicated, so it's okay if like, you know, it sounds okay now, but it might get confusing later. But we, we are here to help. Ah, yeah. Um, in, the, in the change back uh, function, um, is a square bracket really needed? Or you can just put the B? Uh, so you, you could just do ampersand mud V. And um, so, the uh, what I can actually remember is 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 that going to give you a amper like a reference to a vector or if it's going to like under the covers give you a reference to a slice? I think it it might do that. Uh, this might just be a little bit more ex uh, explicit. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Can you return the reference? It depends. So the, like, you know, say you had, you know, your, this wasn't the main function. It was just something that created a, like it created a vector and then you try to return a slice to that. The, you would actually get a compile time error because, uh, you know, someone has to delete the memory. So um, the, in that circumstance, like the compiler would say like, at the end of this function, I'm trying to delete this thing, but you're trying to return a reference to something that, um, however, there are ways of like, you can have methods. Uh, so you could express a method that is returning a reference to something. And like, you know, as long as you, like someone is like, the original object that, that has the block of memory that you want to return a reference to, as long as that is still alive, that uh, you can return references to it. So that 
that gets into hopefully we'll we'll talk a little bit more about that today. If not, like you know, there's I I, I can talk offline about that. It that is like starting to get into like some of the complicated advanced things that we can do with with references. Any other questions? Okay, so. Okay, so uh, oh, the last thing is that like this is one of the other fancy things that Rust has is that you you cannot have like a mutable reference active at the same time as any other references. So here, like say we have a vector, we grab a immutable reference to one of the items inside this vector, and then we try to clear memory. So in languages like C, this can actually, this is actually one of the really big sources of like, you know, causing, you know, security exceptions because like you now have this, you're pointing at like undefined memory and who knows what that's pointing to. So this is, will result in the compile time error. This is also going to be like probably one of the, the areas where Rust gets kind of confusing. Like it, it might take a little bit of time to like understand how to manage mutable references and immutable references to things. So if you feel confused about this, that's normal. We'll, we'll help you get through all of this. So, um, oh, were there any other questions about this? Okay, so finally, all right, so <laughs> that is, um, there's a lot of other things that uh, I am not going through, uh, but we're gonna talk about some of these things uh, later on today. Um, but you know, this hopefully gives you, you know, a little bit of a touch of like, you know, all of the, the core concepts in the language. Um, so you, know, you might run into these today, you might run with them, run to them over the next couple weeks as you play with Rust. Um, there's lots of really cool things out here. So um, yeah, so, the, um, so yeah, these are just some of the concepts. So the last thing that I want to mention before I'm done, and then like I'm actually going to be done, is that like I mentioned a long time ago about like cargo and cargo crates, that we actually have like a really large community that has been building like a bunch of libraries that you can use. Like this is one of like our big things that we are trying to encourage our our ecosystem to develop. Like so, I grabbed this picture from a few days ago. This is our website crates.io. So you can see here that like we've already had 9,600 individual libraries that you can use. That all you have to do is add a line in your cargo.toml file, and you can just start using like any number of these things. And we've already had like over 161 million people, or well, you know, million downloads of all of these different crates. So we have a really large ecosystem. We are trying to make it so that like you don't necessarily need to like implement a lot of things that you know we can have a a really broad standard library without actually having to implement it all ourselves. So with that, um, I am uh, I'm done. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so I don't know if we necessarily have time for questions because I'm really over time. Um, but um, so thank you all. Thank you all for paying attention and <laughs> bearing with me. All right.